All right, folks, Bryce here. Ben is there. We are the hosts of The Property Couch, and today we want to talk about a very, very important topic, don't we, Ben? We do, Bryce. How? Well, well the property industry me. gets paid. We, are we warming up? I oh, know. <laughs> Have we started? How the property industry gets paid? Hey, um, the reason this is really important is because our industry is one of the industries where people can get stung really easily mm, so we want to a lot of money we want to unpack it and we want to yep. have a look under the bonnet yes and show you how that's done so folks uh the way that the property industry gets paid is very different and uh so when you understand what we're about to show you whenever someone presents you with an opportunity whether it's uh, you know in a physical yep. uh, bricks and mortar whether you're in a big shed ben with an expo and lots of people with fancy brochures the number and, one now bryce is the blower are you at right. home? Yep. Oh, do you earn X amount of dollars? Would you like to invest in property for as little as $25 a week? Yep. So the oh, telemarketers. So the when, telemarketers. When you hear from huge. a telemarketer, when you hear from an expo, when you mm. walk into we are going to show you a framework so that once you understand this framework, you just overlay that on any conversation you're having and you will understand it uh, to the fullest. So let's right. have a go. You got me, Bryce. You got me. What do we got? All right. So we've got this quadrant. quadrant. Yep. All right. And there's four parts of the quadrant that I want you to think about. But on this side, Ben, yep. it's really easy. The person who pays uh, the, the bills on this side is the seller, the vendor, the developer, whatever the name is, Ben. Yep. The person who is paying the bills for that particular side is the seller. Yep. And on this side, Ben, I'm going to soften up. Red's a bit harsh. I'm going to make it uh, black. Black. Can't find the green. Let's see if I can find the green. <laughs> oh, here's the green. Got the green. Okay, so that's the first thing you need to understand. If you're taking uh, information or advice or whatever uh, is, um, I guess, tipping you over the edge to mm -hmm. buy a property on this side, Ben, understand the seller's paying. If you have taken advice from this side of the, uh, the quadrant, Ben, understand you as the buyer are paying the bills. Okay? Mm. So let's start with the most obvious one, Ben, is the real estate agent. Okay, so that's the selling agent. The selling agent. Right, yeah, that makes those, sense to me. Those people who aren't familiar with how a real estate agent works, they do not get paid unless they get a result. So mm -hmm. they are very rarely, do they ever get a retainer? Some mm -hmm. of them do, but very yep. rarely do they. If they don't uh, list a property, and then sell the property, they won't get paid. Mm. So therefore, they are getting paid by the seller, Ben, anywhere up to 2.5% plus GST. I was going to say, I've even heard as high as that. Yeah. Right, so between 1% and 3%. With the sweet spot, usually they're trying to get around 2% of the value of the property. Plus GST. <laughs> yes. So if you so were to sell... 2.2% in that case. If you were to sell your property for $700,000, Ben... Yes. They receive part of your receipts mm -hmm. on the house based on whatever they've negotiated. But make yep. no mistake, you as the buyer dealing with a real estate agent, mm -hmm. the person is actually not being paid by you, the buyer, they're being paid by the seller. Therefore, they're acting in the best interest of, not you, no. they're acting in the best interest of their client, which you'd yes. expect in any commercial arrangement. 100%, because we're trying to buy property here. Good property. Their job is to get the maximum result or their vendor, their seller, or the developer that they're working for. But they're not the only people who sell property, are they, Bryce? No. So think, think typically uh, for real estate agents, just think typically sort of established properties. Because then you've yep. got down here, you've got what's called a project marketer. Mm -hmm. Now, Ben, I'm going to have to be full disclosure here. Yep. Full disclosure. Yep. Prior to 2006, yes. I entered the industry in 1998, bought yep. my first property in 1999. I, I just went on, uh, you know, bark on a career one to help people doing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I was a project market event, so yep. I know this space. Yep. And you get anywhere between, you want a green? Wow. <laughs> Six to 10. I was going to say, I've heard as low as four. Yep. But as high as 10% Bryce. And in some cases, just big lump sums, right? Huge. So if you're thinking back to this example here, if it is the full 10% on a 700, that is like 70K in comms. That is, that's crazy. So do the maths on that game, because what you've just said is crazy. Think about that. If I've got a development, if I'm a project marketer, 
And let's say I've got a hundred townhouses to move. Mm -hmm. And Ben, and I'm getting seventy thousand dollars per hundred, uh, sorry, per townhouse, and I've got a hundred to sell. The maths on that is enormous. But mm -hmm. here's the deal: when I have that much uh, revenue that's available to me, what I can do, Ben, is I can go and hire out some amazing uh, hotels. Yep. I can put f uh, fancy um, suits on. Collateral, uh, brochures, the whole experience. I'll even pay for your dinner, Bryce. So yep. not only will I, I hire you the hotel, you can come along and I'll give you a beautiful dinner. Mm -hmm. And I'll make sure that when you walk in a beer, a beer five-star hotel too, as well, I've got a bit of money to burn in. In fact, I could even, you know, sort of have pyramid people underneath me who are helping me get people and I'll do kickbacks referrals. and commissions and referrals into these particular players as well. So all of a sudden, you know, I'm building up all these people to come and buy these properties and Bryce, are they good stock? Well, I would say that they would be investment grade stock, Ben. Uh, investment, investment stock rather yes. than investment grade. Yep. But this this is where you are buying properties that typically have investor appeal. Not always. Mm -hmm. There are always exceptions. But we're trying to give you a framework and a rule here. Typically, and it's the developer investor stock pays that, doesn't they, Bryce? That's they, it. They do. So, yep. Ben. Uh, first of all, you can go to the real estate agent, which we've known for hundreds and hundreds of years. That's what they do. They sell on behalf of the, uh, the seller, mm -hmm. um, typically established. They can do this, but typically for the uh, for the framework here, think established and brand new. All right, Ben. So on this side, the buyer, yep. uh, uh, shows like mine have made it um, uh, more visible in this country, yep. but uh, typically you have a buyer's agent. Mm -hmm. And their job is to actually go and buy real estate, but they do not get paid at all by anyone who's selling the property. They get paid by the buyer. And usually there's two fees, Ben. Yep. Percentage of purchase price or a fixed fee. Okay. Now, the buyer's agent is, uh, I always say there's four things, clarify, find, assess, negotiate. They really uh, yep. bring it down to that. But what what I think is important for uh, from a buyer's agency perspective, excuse me, is uh, we practice what we preach. We're actually yep. going fixed fee rather than a percentage. And quite a lot of them are percentage. Some of them are fixed. You can talk to anyone that uh, you're engaging with to see which one is theirs. But think about this. If I was to uh, sell my principal place of residence for $700,000 and I engage in real estate, and let's use Ben's example of 2% here. If I sell it for 700000 and Ben, because mm -hmm. this real estate agent has skill, They've got negotiation skill, they pit competition together, they yep. market it well, they use all their skills, and they actually get $740,000 instead of seven hundred. I'm actually really happy to pay them 2% of the difference because yep. that extra 40000 less than 2% is actually in my pocket as a seller. Correct. Makes sense to incentivize them. But over here, we've gone down the path of saying, well, you probably don't want to incentivize because what if I have a brief as a buyer's agent for $700,000? And then I get offered an opportunity that I think is really good mm. and I negotiate up to 740000 Does it make sense that I get paid more because I helped you actually spend $40,000? I don't want to plant the seed in mm. someone's mind that I've actually asked them to spend more money because they are paying more. So that's why we've gone down the fix. Yeah, I think the, the fix is the right way to go. And remember, that's effectively fee for service that you as the buyer are paying us to do a professional job and rightly pointed out. If I get you to pay more, because I think it's worth more, but I also get a financial benefit from that, it's a bit of a cloudy sort of a benefit that I should be getting, which is like, no, no, I don't care if you buy for 700000 or a million dollars, my fee's the same, because mm -hmm. ultimately I've still got a job to do and I don't necessarily need to load that up any further. Now, there can be some scales in terms of the work that needs to be done, um, in terms of, in some cases, on a cheaper location, sorry, cheaper property in a cheaper location. Those fees might be a little bit lower than on a, a super expensive, more difficult location because effectively what that business is doing is trying to get a time base in terms of the resources because usually a buyer's agent's backed by resources around research, investigation, support people in behind them. So if we're competing heavily and it's going to take a little bit longer to buy that property, it could be that we've priced that into the time base that it takes us to secure that property. All right, Ben. Now, so think from this part of the quadrant to the top. Yep. This is effectively the transaction. Yep. 
I think from this part down. So we've got the, so the seller right across. The yep. Transaction across here as well. Yes. Here is where the advice lives, right? Yep. So if we're going advice at the bottom, transaction at the top, seller that side, buyer pays on this side. This person here is a property investment advisor. Yep. And we like to put in here, Ben. A little Q for QPIA. So I'll finish that off. Well, the reason I left it, uh, the reason I left it dotted, um, but I like what you've done there, is um, because it's not. Uh, essential like you, you you can go anyone who can do something on the back of a napkin better. Yep. so it's not law it's not mandated like if you go to a financial planner they've got to have a license correct but we would strongly recommend that you go and speak to a qualified property investment advisor and the difference is that they've done formal qualification formal education just like you would when you're getting an accounting degree just like you would when you're becoming a mortgage broker even you've got formal qualifications becoming a real estate agent which you need to be also up here. So uh, they've gone and said, if I want to do this, and they're not moonlighting on, and they're not an accountant who's moonlighting as a property investment advisor, they're not a mortgage broker who's moonlighting as someone, that's not what we want to see. So that's why we recommend that they put a bit of effort in, they've gone and done some study, and now they're putting that study into practice in terms of looking after you. they know the client. And their fee picture. for service. Mm -hmm. They're not someone who's also taking commission over here. Because one of the big selling points over here, Bryce, is that these guys claim that they're free. Yes. Right? It's enticing, Ben. It is. But the reality is that there is no such thing as a free lunch. You are just paying for it through the comms and potentially the increased value that they're putting on, on the property, the loading that they're doing in terms of getting that up there. So be careful if anyone says anything's free, no such thing as a free lunch, somebody's paying and usually it's the uh, the buyer over here who's being sold into some type of stock list. Very good point, Ben. What I always say is if, uh, if you're getting something for free, you are the product. Think yep. about Facebook as the perfect example. You get to use Facebook uh, for free, which means you as the user of the product so yep. that they can sell ads. Same applies. If you get something for free here, it means you are the product to someone else. And in this case, you are the product to the developer mm. on behalf of this project marketer. Now, the reason I've done this as an advice, Ben, yep. is because I think this is questionable here. Um, I was a project marketer, was back in the old days. I, I was an enthusiastic amateur when I first started, Ben, because I thought I was doing the best thing by the client. But what it actually means is, if I'm actually being paid by the seller, trying to give advice to the buyer, I've got a conflict of interest. It's just blatant that I've got a conflict of interest. Because there's nothing wrong with someone who's a project marketer who is masquerading as a salesperson mm. because they've asked, the developers ask them to sell something on their behalf and they're in a sales role and they're doing that. It's when they start to say that they're giving advice, that's where we start to say it moves into spruker territory because their agenda is for the seller but trying to masquerade as in being in the best interest of the buyer. So this is why it's important. So over here, Ben, again, you talked about it, you get it for free, but you're gonna pay a flat fee. Yep. And in some cases, that could be as low as a thousand, uh, right up to five thousand. Now, what I would say to you again on this scale is um, ask for experience. Um, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. What sort of uh, information are you getting? How in depth will they go into you? Because that will determine on which end of the scale. If you want it more, if you want it totally comprehensive, yeah. future planning, you're going to be on the high end of the scale. If you want it to be sort of back of napkin, Ben, it'll be on the yeah, lower look, end. This of the is scale. my space, isn't it, bro? It's just like the buyer's agency is your space up there. Um, at this sort of level, you want a detailed plan with thorough investigations, exploring you personally, tailored solution, as opposed to, you know, for $1,000, you might get one consultation with a little back of nap napkin ember calculations or an off the shelf type uh, report that everyone gets. And there's no personalization to that. So be careful in terms of the value that you see in regards to the price that you pay. Couple of things I want you to be aware of, folks. If you understand this, can you now see if you overlay that into any decision? Because um, what happens on this side of the equation here, generally speaking, on the seller side, you go, I have uh, a need to buy an investment property. Usually this side of the equation, they go, great. I've actually got one for you. Yep. Whereas on this side of the equation, instead of saying, hey, look, here's one I prepared earlier, they're going to say, hmm, let me, let me understand you a little bit more. Where are we headed? What's the goal? Yep. What sort of risk profile do you have? What's your appetite for lending? How much time have we got? Um, is there anything that we need to be uh, concerned about whether you are risk averse going interstate or buying uh, locally? All those sorts of questions mean that you understand the buyer's perspective rather than just saying, hey, look, Here's the one off the shelf for you, Ben.
That's right. Um, and all of this in terms of the, you know how the industry is paid is in our best-selling book, The Armchair Guide to Property Investing. So if you haven't checked that out, do so because there's lots of gold and information in here. Ben, I mean, as, sorry, mate. You yeah. go. Oh, I was just, as we wrap this up, there's a couple of things I want people to be aware of. Yes. Um, and the first thing that I want you to be, uh, be aware of is uh, understand that those selling the mining tools mm -hmm. often make more money than those people doing the mining, right? So if I was in uh, Bendigo or Ballarat back mm -hmm. in the gold rush, Ben, I probably would have sold a lot of money selling pickaxes. Yes, got and it. probably make more money than if I actually had it done prospecting, for, prospecting gold. for gold. Yep. So that analogy works here in, um, in property too because these guys who are getting these enormous commissions mm -hmm. are usually making more money from the commissions than they are from the, yep. the process and the strategy that they're implementing. Because do the maths. All they need to do is get two or three of those and they've got a deposit easily on buying their own property within the development, which then they usually say, hey, I'm buying in that development as Correct. well. It's not under the same rules. No, that's right. And I think if we, if we stick to the gold analogy that we're running here, Bryce, there's fool's gold when it comes to some of this project marketing stuff as well. So, you know, if we've got blocks of land big parcels of land that are being subdivided and so forth. Now there's going to be literally thousands and thousands of blocks that are going to come out of those particular subdivisions. Now the question for that is there's potential for an oversupply in that particular area. So that's always risky as well in regards to potentially buying off them because they usually 100% of the time are selling new stock, not necessarily existing stock as well. So You've got this fool's goal where you go out and buy in areas or you buy an apartment or developments where there's hundreds if not thousands of lots and that can risk the capital growth story in those particular properties as well over the short term. The other thing I want to talk uh, about being aware of, Ben, is high price mm -hmm. education. Yep. Um, now, I'm, not, I'm the first to admit that um, I'm happy to invest in myself, I'm happy to invest in my education, Ben, but what I am concerned about is the... Uh, the exorbitant prices that are being charged for you. There's people who will package up courses in this with similar information to what we've got in the book that costs thirty dollars, mm. and they'll charge tens of thousands of dollars yeah. Yeah. Um, to package that up. The mining tools, folks. Someone might be selling you the pickaxes for you to go and do the uh, the prospecting. So high priced education is something else I want you to be aware of. And the last thing for me is a concept. Uh, called two tier marketing, and it's been cleaned up a little bit, but it still happens where they will prospect into a market that are used to higher real estate prices, mm -hmm. put them into a cheaper market so that the price sounds cheap in uh, relative terms to the house that they're buying, but it's heavily overpriced because mm -hmm. the two tiers are the first tier is the locals know mm -hmm. that there's a certain price. Yep, that's the, unsuspecting for those people that they're selling interstate by. The interstate is yep. a second tier price. So, for Come example, to our seven hour event. Yeah, mm -hmm. might be 600000 that sounds cheap. But when you go to the locals, that's actually overpriced by 100000 Yeah. So, two tier marketing. Yeah, so that's, no, that's a good one, Bryce. Well. So, folks, how does the property industry get paid? This is how they get paid there's the transaction part of the quadrant, there's the advice part of the quadrant. There's the buyer side of the equation, there's the seller side of the equation. Once you understand this very, very simple framework, um, as I said before, Ben, it's evergreen. Yep. It's a concept that you can then overlay. So if you are being faced with a decision on whether you should be buying an investment property right now, which quadrant are you taking the information from? Because uh, if you're on this side, uh, I'd say KVD Emptor. Yep. And on this side, I'd say ask for experience. And I'd go in two steps. Step one here, step two here. So get your advice, work out what the best price is that you can afford comfortably from a cash flow point of view, that you can sustain over, sustain over the long term, and then basically get a buyer's agent who's a licensed real estate agent to get out there and buy that property for you. Hey folks, hope that helps. If you've got any questions, leave it in the comments below. We'll get to that in one of our upcoming Facebook Lives. But we have a podcast that Ben and I do every Thursday. It comes, uh, comes out at Ben at 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock on Thursdays. This week we have got an absolute ripper. So you should check that out at thepropertycouch.com.au.